All right, so <clears throat> I don't typically do military metaphors. But you know what? If we're going to talk about shooting and winning and losing and all of that, then let's really do it. So, I mean, let's really, let's really examine this and look at it seriously. So, who are we shooting at? Why are we shooting? What's the point? What are we trying to gain? So, let's go with this. I began with Sun Tzu, the military strategist. Um, the general who wins is the one who makes calculations and figures out what he's doing and why and makes the right calculations. The one who loses doesn't really do that. The, you know your enemy and know yourself and you're probably going to win. If you don't, well, good luck. So let's do what Sun Tzu is saying. Let's, uh-oh, there we go. Okay. So let's start with thinking about our adversaries, but let's look at them seriously. So who are our adversaries? Well, they're a small fraction of the populace. The people who really make the decisions are not very many. In whatever country, whatever system you're looking at, the people who really make the decisions really aren't that many. It's a tiny fraction of the populace. Okay. They require full compliance and full censorship. If you, we have seen this in spades over the last several years. What are they telling us without telling us? If they require full censorship, what are they saying? They're saying they can't survive or they're afraid of honest discussion and honest opinion. If you don't agree with them, they will shut you down. They can't, they're telling us, they're advertising how fragile they are. They're advertising that they can't handle open, honest discussion. That's interesting. That's very interesting. I mean, and I don't care what, you know, if left, right, political this, whatever it is, they can't handle real, honest discussion. That's interesting, what they're telling us. Um, their power ultimately rests upon people mistrusting themselves. I'll talk more about that later. They have to keep lots of group happy, billionaires, unions, everyone forgets unions, um, and a lot of other things. They've got a lot of people to keep happy at the same time. Um, they're economically vulnerable, uh, and you know they're they're shedding faith. Um, certainly, where I live in the states, more and more and more people are saying, you know, these guys are maniacs. They're nuts, and they're coming to the point where people are regular people, not not radicals like us, but regular people are turning off the TV. And so this is they're shedding faith. And I don't think it's going to turn around anytime soon. So they're telling us things about themselves. If they're saying, we need the Great Reset, okay, what are they telling you about their system? A thriving system doesn't need to be reset. They're telling us that their system is vulnerable and they're worried about it and they're not sure it's going to last this way, that they need something else. That's very interesting. Okay, ourselves, we're a growing minority. You know, in the 1990s, let's say, if you took people and said, you know, we all think that this idea of state and governance as we have it in the world is, is a relic of the Bronze Age, and it's really a mistake. We should move on to something better. You, you, couldn't, you could barely fill a any kind of room with all the people you could get. Probably could all of us could have felt that fit on a bus. There just weren't very many. Now, there are people who resonate with that everywhere. I mean, there are Bitcoin meetups in almost every city of the world. And there's a lot of people who would agree with that kind of statement in Bitcoin meetups, not to mention everything else. We've grown really fast, really fast in 19, let's say, 77, which is, um, you would have said people who, who thought the state was a misguided idea? There's almost no one. Now, there's millions, literally millions, who would entertain this notion. That's a big deal. You know, we tend to want things fast, but these things don't go fast. They go slow. 
And, but if you do step back and allow it to be slow, oh my God, we've come a long, long way. We are, and I say we are morally superior. And here's what I mean. I don't mean that we never make mistakes. But we care about morality. We care about the golden rule. Or if you like, the non-aggression principle. They're almost the same thing. Um, we care about those things. Yeah, we make our own stupidities from time to time. Yes, we make mistakes. Yes, sometimes people are assholes. Whatever. But we care about those things. The system? Are you kidding me? They don't care. It's all show. They, they care. They care. They tra talk nice for the election so they can get elected. But we all know. Every adult knows that they really don't give a damn. But we do. We're morally better. Not morally perfect, but morally better. We are. Um, we have many of the best minds. Subjective statement on my part? Yeah. But just because it's subjective doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means it's hard to prove. <laughs> but we do have a lot of excellent minds. We have encryption, which is a powerful weapon and a defensive weapon. We don't hurt anybody with our weapon. It's not like, you know, attacking the enemy and blowing up a bridge. And now the people of that town can, can't get to market. People don't like that. Okay? We don't do those things. We have a powerful weapon, but it doesn't hurt anybody. That's really interesting. That's a major advantage for us. We have been substanti substantially hardened, and that is, you know, bad things have happened to freedom people. You know, where's Julian Assange? Where's Ross Ulbricht? Where are a lot of other people? We've taken our blows. Those are emotional blows when they happen to people like you. Those are hard things, and we've taken them. It's kind of like, you know, in military, in physical battle, you know, you say, you have, oh, our soldiers have been battle-hardened. You know, they've been through this before. They're going to fight a lot better. Well, that's a lot of us, un unfortunately and fortunately. Now, here's the but at the bottom. And this is going to seem kind of contrary, but stay with me. We've not committed to winning. And what I mean by that is we've committed to a lot of things correctly, nobly, We've committed to being right, being opposition, being underdogs, and thriving, and being good. And we've committed to winning battles. But I think we can win, as in win-win, as in getting our way in the world. Perfectly, no. Fast, no. It's always going to take time. 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. But you know what? Those years are going to pass anyway. Maybe we can win while we're getting there. Not just survive the evil, but to get what we want to happen in the world. Interesting prospect. Seems utterly impossible to many of us. But we can win. We have to commit to it, but we can actually win-win. Now, let's pick on ourselves to start with, okay? Let's pick on ourselves, because we might as well. This is exceedingly cool, okay? I've wanted one of these for years, okay? It's just freaking cool. But it's not winning. It's different. It's surviving. It's being the noble underdog. It's those sorts of things, which are noble things. If you've got to be the underdog, then be, be a good one. And it's noble, and it's righteous, to use an old word, to do those things. I'm not criticizing. I mean, that's been a lot of my life, too. But what if we could actually win? It's, uh, we could really do it. I mean, that, as lovely as it is, is not winning. Now, this is important. If we want to win, we cannot focus on the things we oppose. We have to ignore them. Maybe we can't ignore them all the way. Fine. Okay. If you can't, then you can't. But we want to ignore them. We want to focus on what we're working for. And here's why this is a giant problem. Because if you watch TV, if you're on social media, if you do any of these things, the system, the state, 
well, it's much more than the state, the corporations, the whatever. As we used to say in the old days, the establishment. It's this big. If you read the newspapers, any of these things, the establishment is this big. It clouds your entire field of view. It encompasses everything. And you're always emotionally responding to it. Whether you love it or whether you hate it, it doesn't matter. It's still this big in front of your face and you're responding to it. Oh, we're never going to stand for that. Or we're going to do this. And we're going to figure out how to get around their stupid whatever. Get rid of it. Once you get rid of it, you begin to focus on where you're going. You begin to focus on what you want. What do you love? What do you want to create? Screw them. We don't want to care about them. If we have to for some reason, fine. But we, then we want to get it out of the way. We don't want them to take up our field of vision. We want to see where we're going. It's hard enough. We want to see what we want to build. What is this world that we want to create? What is it really? This is what we have to do, because as long as we keep this, you know, 10 tons of refuse in front of our eyes, it'll stay there. I mean, it's just all too easy to do. And we're always going to be, oh, they're going to do this, and we're not going to. We want to build what we love. We want to build what we care about. And I'm convinced that we can. Easy? No. Fast? No. But yeah, we can win. Now, <laughs> for the people who say that winning is impossible, well, <laughs> you know, for those of you who missed it, you know, it, Joe Biden, whatever he is, um, <laughs> he started telling the, you know, the Americans who, who like having guns, yeah, you really think you're going to fight the government? Right, you need F-15s and you need nukes. Oh, really, Joe? <laughs> so this was, you know, it's funny, it's humor but it's only funny because there's truth to it. And the adversaries that we have are not gods. They're not. They have a very specific way of operating, and their operations have a lot of fragility built into it. At this point, after so many years of triumph after triumph for them, they can't handle noncompliance. If you don't comply, oh yeah, one or two, you're Julian Assange or Ross Ulbricht, they can put your head on a pike. Yes, they can. But 5% compliance, non-compliance, they're in trouble. 10%, they're pretty much doomed. 20%, it's only a number of months. So they're not the gods that this giant blocking your whole field of vision would indicate. They're not. So, What's important if we're going to fight them? What's important is attacking their strategy. Not their little tactics, not the new rule or regulation they're rolling out this week. That's, that's just a little tactic. That's not strategy. If we're going to fight, we have to attack their strategy, not the little daily, the daily stuff that they throw out. Okay, now let's talk about their strategy. For them, survival requires mass deception. They thrive only if billions of people believe them and serve them. In other words, people have to believe that it's the right thing to do to do what they say. You, they don't have enough policemen to terrorize everybody into doing the right thing. Even the USSR didn't. They spent 80% of their, of their secret police money on public opinion. Um, so one of the things that I stumbled across almost by accident, and I'll, let me say this and then I'll explain what I mean because, again, it may not sound quite right at first. At some point in the distant past, good overcame evil in the human species. Well, people still do evil, right? Evil doesn't work if it's open, if it's honest. You have to trick people into doing evil. 
Now, there's some small, small number of people that are just will be evil. But if I go out on the street here, on any street, and I go out and say, hey, come up to some guy and say, hey, I got a hammer. Let's go hit that guy on the head and see how long it takes him to die. It'll be cool. Okay? No one is going to go along with you. I mean, nobody's going to go with such a, cra- such a thing because goodness overcame evil in the human species. In an open, head-to-head, honest competition, clear, humans don't do evil. They have to be tricked into doing evil. So, I want to give you a couple things, a couple quotes. I'll just do them quickly. One is a guy who studied this quite a bit, a good book called, called Humankind. It says, evil doesn't live just beneath the surface. And this is a guy who examined all the cases that people say, you know, evil lurks just beneath the surface of a thin veneer of civilization and in our hearts we're all monsters. Yeah, not. Evil doesn't live just beneath the surface. It takes immense effort to draw it out. And most importantly, it has to be disguised as doing good. Hmm. And then... This second one is from a guy named Don Mixon. Everybody remembers the Milgram obedience experiments where they had to push the button and ele- you know, supposedly electrocuted people because you know, a man in a white coat told you to. Okay. Mixon went back and he listened to all the tapes. They were old reel-to-reel tapes. And they had the old tapes from, from the Milgram experiments. And he listened to the tapes and he replicated the experiment himself. Here's what he says. He says, people will go to great lengths, suffer great distress to be good. People in the experiments got caught up in trying to be good. And here's what he found. What they told them was, look, so many, I don't remember what the number was, you know, 100,000 people commit suicide every year in just the United States. Fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, tragic. If we can get this right, We can end that worldwide. 10 million people in the next 10 years whose lives we can save. The experiment requires you to continue. That's what they sold these people who obeyed. That's the way it works. People will do all sorts of things if you can convince them it's good. But if you can no longer convince them that it's good, that it's right for important people to order us around, then all of a sudden, it doesn't work so well anymore. So this is really important. So with this in mind, those who are skilled in war bring the enemy to the field of battle that they choose. What we've been doing is we've been reacting to the enemy the whole time. No, I understand. It's been necessary, it's the way we had to start, but we need to start acting our way and let them react to us. So what is, where, what is the battlefield we need to pick? These are the battlefields we need to pick. Now, we've already been doing it to some extent with Bitcoin, lightning and whatever else. We've been doing it. I mean, there's little old ladies who buy, who buy rice with, with Bitcoin. There's a lot of people that do a lot of things with Bitcoin, regular people. These are the battlefields that matter. These are the people where we have to address our efforts. Whether we're used to it or not doesn't matter. Do we want to win? If we want to win, we have to fight on the battlefields that matter. It's going to be slow. They'll never listen to us. No, they won't at first. We're all here. How did we get here? They're going to get here the same way. Little by little, piece by piece, one step at a time. If we could get here, we're not from some different planet than everyone else. If we get, he- get here, they can get here too. So these are the type of things we have to start looking at. And this also is important. We do not want 10,000 or 100,000 people to all of a sudden move into our space. We want ones and twos. We want people who are s- become solid who understand what it is, who are willing to be insulted because they have understood that this is real and this is important, that have seen Bitcoin or whatever and say, my God, a decentralized way of life 
is possible. And then begin to see what it is. You know, the old t-shirt came for the Lambo, stayed for the revolution. You know? Okay. <laughs> you know, it goes that way. So we, we don't want some famous guy. Let's pick on Elon Musk. He's a big boy. Um, you know, Elon Musk is telling us all to do this. Let's all go. He's the richest guy in the world, don't you know? He must know. Let's, we don't want those people. Okay. We want ones and twos. We need to forget about the great numbers. We want quality people and just keep building. So, when we get these regular people, what do we offer them? It needs to be clear, it needs to be simple, it needs to be something that everybody wants. Okay, here's a few ideas. Oh, it doesn't quite make it on there. It says, a comprehensible world. How about a world where you're not confused all the time, where you're not afraid all the time? You don't have to worry about something going sideways tomorrow and it's not your fault you didn't even know there was regulation? How about that? How about that? And the slide didn't come out that well, but in even I want everyone to understand, when you see these th images like this, don't ever let tell you, somebody tell you it's all fantasy. It's not. I grew up in that. Perfect? No, of course not. This is a this is a, an image, but I was pl I, I lived that way. So don't let anyone tell you, oh, it's a fantasy. No, it's a nice little image. They they crowded about ten different things into one image to make it crisp and nice. But I grew up that way. A lot of people did. And if we could do it in ni 1960s, you tell me it couldn't be done now. Of course it could be done now. In our way decentralized, voluntary, golden rule. That's what makes this happen. This is, that produces this. And listen, you guys had it in Eastern Europe before the First World War. It was a very comprehensible moment when you could understand all about the world, when you could understand all the things that might impact upon your life. Here's uh, Friedrich Hayek, who was born in 1899, so he understood that world. He knew many, his parents lived through it, his grandparents lived through it. And he says, you know, it used to be that free men would boast, would brag. And they said that as long as we knew, as long as we kept within the bounds of known law, that is the law that everybody understands, and not 10,000 pages of regulations sitting, taking up four shelves in a law library, but what everybody knew, says, as long as you did that, there was no need to ask anybody's permission or obeys anyone, anyone's order. Can you imagine a world like that? Can you imagine what it does for your, for your mind? You don't have to ask permission from anybody for anything. You don't have to obey some, somebody's orders. Hayek wrote about this because he knew it. Okay? He lived in it as a boy, and he had people that he knew that lived in it. This is possible. This was right here in this city, in Prague, in um, Budapest, in Vienna, before, in a in hundred smaller places before the First World War. It was like that. It was, it was, nothing's perfect. Of course it wasn't perfect. And if you look around, you can find exceptions. There's always that. that those are human problems. Okay? We're, th those aren't going to go away. Those will go away over, you know, hopefully not too many thousand years. But this is the way people lived. It was real, and I'm telling you, when I was a boy, where I grew up, this was real. It was never perfect. We always had a few jerks or, you know, whatever. But it wasn't fake. Here's what else we can promise them and give them. A world without scarcity. We know right now how to grow enough food for everybody. More than enough food for everybody. It's not a problem. And we've been able to do this for a long time. We know how to build enough houses for everybody. We have supply chains. We know all the details of how to do it. We can build enough cars for everybody. We can make enough clothing for everybody. We already have the machinery in place for a post-scarcity world. We know how to do it. It's not, it's not even a question. Here is Julian Simon who who worked on precisely this question for 
decades, and this is 1988, he says, we have enough technology now without inventing anything else that will allow everyone on the earth and, and many more to have what we have in the United States. Well, it was pretty good in the United States in 1988. Um, all we need is a social and economic organization that will allow it to happen. Not bring it about, but allow it to happen. I've got same kind of quote from Norman Borlaug, who was the man who invented modern agriculture, probably saved a billion lives, literally. And he says the same thing. He quotes a figure, we could, we could easily support 10 trillion people, knowing just what we have now. And we got Buckminster Fuller. He put the changeover date in about 1969. We know how to do that. The current systems, the current establishment is unable to do it. They burn the surplus. I mean, they just burn it. I mean, what do you call military stuff? You're just taking piles and piles of money and literally blowing it up. Okay. So we know now and have known for decades how to build enough and have enough for every person on the planet. Yeah, there'll still be gaps, there'll still be problems, there'll still be a sad case here and there because, well, that's life. That's, that's humanity at this particular moment. But we know how to do this. This isn't an empty promise when we can say we can, we're done with scarcity forever. That's not an empty promise. We know how to do it. And we can also do this. There's no reason we can't be doing this now. I don't know, probably almost nobody knows this, this is not as hard as it used to be. The nation of India, not who you think of as a space power, has a satellite orbiting Mars successfully. They have eight years ago, I think. It's not that hard. Doing these the first time, that's hard. But doing them now, it's not. I mean, the first, the first men went to the moon in 1968. That's a long time. They landed the next year, but they went to the moon in 68. That's a long time ago. So what was hard in 1968 is not terribly hard anymore. The computers that landed on the moon had one 250,000th of the power of your cell phone. Hmm. Okay. So this is not impossible. And I got these two quotes from these two gentlemen. They were, first of all, astronauts who both landed on the moon. And they were also, you know, being an astronaut was not just going in space. You spent years going through every part of that space, space machine. Uh, and these were very bright guys. And these two men also happened to be engineers. I'll, I'll try to give you the John Young quote because I heard him say this. Here's the way he said, he says, he was bitter. He says, I thought we'd go to the moon and put up a base and stay there. We should have done that. But we, if we had, the world would be infinitely better, but we didn't. He was pissed. Neil Armstrong, who was, you know, Mr. Calm, which is probably why they put him first guy in the moon, because he was Mr. Calm. You know, and he says, oh, I fully expected, but by the end of the century, would have achieved substantially more than we actually did. I mean, the whole thing was, was you know, it was a great adventure. But they went to the moon and they picked up rocks. That's it. You go to the moon, you pick up rocks, that's all you do? Are you nuts? Oh, they left some, some, some experiments. But this is not that hard. You want adventure? You want a life of adventure? You want something that's, that's daring and risky and, and, and immensely attractive? You do something crazy great? How about this? We can do this. We got one guy who's almost doing it by himself. It's not beyond us. These, the life of high adventure is in front of us. So can we commit to winning? Not to surviving the attacks. That's good. It's noble. It's necessary. But we can win. We can win. So to do that, how do we do it? We modify our tactics in relation to our opponent. Okay, with the people standing in our, in our way, we have to attack their strategy. Okay, how do we do that? Huh, how about if we could have some non-evil smartphones? Smartphone doesn't have to be evil. 
doesn't have to be, you know, a spy device tied into, you know, vampires. Doesn't have to be. We can make our own apps if we want apps. How about just putting in a reverse firewall? I used to have a reverse firewall I bought for 20 bucks. You put it on and nothing leaves your computer unless you want it to. What does that do to the vampires? Huh. Well, you know, creating a, a new a, a smartphone that's not evil, you can also automatic mesh with it. Why not? We know pretty well how to do that. You know, the engineers are going to be mad at me because they're going to say, yeah, you think it's easy? No, I, it's not. But we know how to do it. It can be done. So what are you going to say? Oh, it's too expensive. It'll cost $10 million to build, to build a thing? How many times has $10 million gone into some of the garbage coins that have been made? A whole lot of 10 millions. Okay? We don't have the money to do it. We can't do it. Of course we could do it. Of course we can. So maybe that's some place to start. This is just ideas. How about providing an adult voice in the world? Adults are out of style, but you know what? Being an adult is cool. Okay, I don't want to be a permanent child. I, I didn't want that when I was 20. <laughs> um, you know, how about serious information for serious adults? Just a thought, you know. Not the voice of the, not the, voice of the underground. Not the voice of the resistance. We're not the resistance. We're the winners. We're going to get a better world. It's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be better. And we're going to build what we want. Okay, I got a couple little quotes here I like, you know, just for fun. I mean, I don't write advertising. It's very different than what I do, but I had a little fun with it. You know, you can interrupt yourself 10 times a day and waste half your time, or you can spend 20 minutes with us. You'll be a lot better informed and a lot less manipulated. Okay, I kind of like that. Or if you wanted to be treated like a child, go to the alphabet soup. I mean, CNN, BBC, ABC, NBC, you know, the alphabet soup. If you, if you want to be treated like a child, go to the alphabet soup. If you want to be treated like an, an adult, come to us. Because we're the grown-ups. We're the grown-ups now. And we're gonna act like, we can act like the grown-ups and be the grown-ups. Why not? How about an exterior web? Nah, it's just a term I made up. How about, you know, a, a set of things that aren't focused on evil and bad and dark and doom and everything is horrible and we're all going to die and all that stuff. How about something that's, that's focused on the good? Websites, you know, I like, again, my little advertising line. You can spend your time getting angry and scared or you can spend your time becoming better. Don't make the stupid choice. Right? Now, here's my little contribution. Veraverba.com. Every morning, you get something good happening in the world. Somebody who did something kind and loving, something that to be happy about, something to think about, something to learn something from. They're very brief, one picture in a couple short paragraphs, and they all end the same way. It says, now, before going back to the mundane, think about this or go do this. Because the establishment is not just dark and evil. It's mundane. It's boring. It's the same old crap every day. Be afraid. Be afraid of this. Tomorrow we can be afraid of this. Oh, and don't worry because, you know, the big hefe great leader, oh yeah, forget about the old one who's in jail. But the new one, he's going to save us from, you know, all this stuff. Okay? How about something good? How about using our money more than we have? Now look, Parallel Polis has been exemplary in this. But I think all of us can do better. I think oh, we need to use our money more. Certainly, at least between ourselves, we shouldn't, be using, we shouldn't be using fiat hardly at all. We can do better. So we have Bitcoin. We have Lightning. We have Liquid. If you don't like Bitcoin, use Bitcoin Cash. If you don't want that, you can use Monero or Decred or whatever you want. We had a great presentation here a few years ago on Scrit. Somebody can finish that off and start using. I don't care. Pick your money. We have a plethora of options on money. We need to use it more. We need to try to use it exclusively if at all possible. You know, however you like. Publish prices in sats and let people learn how to, you know, how to convert. It's not that hard. You know, we don't have to, everything doesn't have to, have to be for children. 
We can be grown-ups and deal with grown-ups. Okay, we need to engage those that have been spat out of the system. The system is losing people. The system is, you know, has got a lot of problems. I'm actually worried about Europe this winter. Um, but this is, this is just a quote from, from a Roman emperor. As Rome was, Western Empire was falling apart and collapsing, he says, it's disgraceful. They can see our people lacking. We're not helping them. The Jews take care of their own. The godless Galileans, those are the Christians, uh, they take care of their own and hate they help ours also, but we're not helping them. Huh. That tells us something. That tells us that a giant system that's collapsing, that's falling apart, that's being nibbled away at on the fringes, this was the thing that the guy in charge, who was an intelligent man, this is the thing he was worried about. I think there's a really big clue there. Now, this is a, a presentation all of its own how to do that. But this is an interesting clue. A guy who was our enemy uh, almost 2,000 years ago, who was bewailing what was happening to him, this is the thing he was worried about. Maybe we should pay attention to that. Okay, we need to choose the rules we want and play the game that we want. Um, I, I, when I first did this, I, I made a reference to something called Calvin Ball. Does anybody in the room know what Calvin Ball is? No. Oh, oh well, I see a couple. <laughs> um, it, it was a silly thing from a, from a comic thing in the United States, but the little boy named Calvin, and he plays these games with his friend, and he just changes the rules every time so he could win every game. <laughs> okay? So they call it Calvin Ball. You know, he just, in the middle of the game, he'll just change the rules so he can win. Well, that's what, that's what the establishment is doing. Well, we can play Calvin Ball too. Why can't we play Calvin Ball? We'll make up the game we want, we'll play the rules we want, and let them adapt to us. We're a lot better at a lot of things than they are. But we haven't acted like it because we haven't had a vision of winning. We've had a vision of surviving. And that's fine. Necessary. But we need a vision of winning. What does it look like? Okay, We don't have many visions of it. We need those. We need to start doing this and saying, I'm building this. Take, the, take all the negativity, throw it aside, ignore them. Okay? There were plenty of people who were complaining about the Roman Empire when it was at height. Lots and lots of people. Conservatives, that or something like what we would call conservatives. Um, they had anarchists. They're called cynics. And they were walking around saying, you know, the state is a bad idea. Men ruling over other men is, is an abomination. It's horrible. It should never happen. And all of these guys went down with Rome. You don't hear about many cynics anymore. But the group that didn't do that, that did survive and did take over Europe, were the Christians. They didn't fight Rome. They didn't support Rome. They said, you are this. We are not of that. We're building this. So for whatever their benefit, whatever their virtues, whatever their vices, they did the different thing. They weren't reacting to Rome. They were doing their thing. That's what we have to do. Okay. We have to build what we want and let them respond to us. Now, this is to me the most important thing of this, this whole thing. If you go away remembering nothing, this is something you, I want you to remember and I want you to think about, please. And I think it's something we need to get inside of us. The world doesn't happen to us. We happen to the world. That's a big thing. The world doesn't happen to us. We happen to the world. This needs to be our attitude. This needs to be the way we wake up in the morning and decide what we're going to do. We happen to to the world, not vice versa. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And on that note, I leave you. We can win if we want to. We really, truly can win. Slow, difficult, hard, yeah, but it's going to be slow, difficult, and hard anyway. But we can win. Thank you. Do you have time? Thank you.
I think we can uh, ask some questions. I will start. Uh, I'm not watching the alphabet soup for a long time now. <laughs> I don't even remember. But when I see something, I just when I read an article or see some some news or something, I think someone just takes took some very bad drugs. <laughs> it doesn't even make sense, you know, a, a guy sending soldiers somewhere to, you know, shoot at people, and it doesn't make any sense at all. So, yeah. <laughs> so thank you, thank you for this part because uh, when you realize that you don't have to be involved. Uh, in all this nonsense and you realize that it's it's just insane it's that it's just someone has basically broken brain <laughs> and it's very uh, very nice so um i guess it's not a question but i really liked uh, uh, like this part and um so there is a question here uh thank you That's great Great speech, very inspiring. Oh, thank um, you. So you talked about post-scarcity, and I think there's a whole academic field of progress studies, which gives some, I think, good um, you know, intellectual backing for that. But I've noticed that people like Matt Ridley, Rational Optimist, that messaging doesn't seem that popular. So how do we actually convince people that that's not just utopian thinking, that this actually is achievable? OK, good question. Um, what happens, there's, there's a couple different things that happen. First of all, there's a natural aversion to, uh, for, to escaping scarcity. It, it's so different that people are afraid of it. And remember, we have built a whole lot of our lives emotionally around the idea of scarcity. If you really have no scarcity, status dies. Status is built, and most of our lives, our mating strategies are built around status. And they're built around difference between, look, we're guys. We want, us, we want the girls to be impressed with us, right? I mean, you know, that's, that's part of life when you're a certain age. You know, you want, you want, you know, all the girls to really think you're cool. Okay. And, you know, you do that with sort of status things. It doesn't have to be just that, but as a practical matter, it very often is. Uh, once you eliminate scarcity, you eliminate status, and, or at least undercut it very, very majorly. And that frightens people. And they may not even understand it, but it's very frightening. And it's going to be a big obstacle going forward. Um, if there is no more status, you know, it's a problem because we're kind of wired for it even. And it's a problem. So there's that. And that, that bothers people. Plus, it's so different. And you show your, your virility, your strength. Oh, yeah, they're doing this and I'm going to tell them what. This is a show. I mean, it might be authentic. You might understand it and be authentically upset by it. But it's also a way people show themselves to be potent, to be strong, to be whatever. Um, and the truth is that they won't listen right away. That's okay. We just keep doing it. We just keep saying it. And it doesn't sell. Okay. I don't care. I'm not selling. I'm not here for clicks. I'm here to actually do something. And so once you do that, it takes time. And it will eventually, it will eventually work. It will eventually matter. But it's a very tough, slow process. I hope that helps. So um, thank you so much for identifying so the, the crisis in conscience and despair in the community and coming with such an incredibly positive message that actually makes me want to cry from my whole heart, Paul. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. My question is, what was the moment for you that shifted into this narrative, how did you make that jump and journey? Because I've had these conversations with you and we've all had them with each other. And to see this is just like, is just like really an epiphany 
So what clicked for you personally? Good question. There were a lot of little ones. Um, seeing somebody who changes, seeing somebody who turns their life around and going a different way. I got to tell you, a big part of it, um, and I'll give you the, the, most, the most direct one in just a moment, but a big part of it's coming here. I mean, I began in cryptography stuff in the middle 1990s, and we were crazy people. We were goofy, you know, weird people you know, playing with math and doing weird stuff and multiplying prime numbers. It's, what's wrong with you? You know, and you're, nobody believes you. No one, no one does what, you know, you're, you're, you're goofy. And then well, Bitcoin came along, but at first no one knew what Bitcoin was. I mean, I was busy. I was running a company. I didn't have time to, to do this. And, and the early Bitcoiners, uh, I suppose I'm guilty as any of anybody, did a kind of piss poor job explaining it. Okay, we just didn't, we didn't do a very good job of it. But okay, it's, it's hard, it's, it was new, it's very different. But coming here, and over the years, just watching hundreds of people who really get it, walking around. I mean, I found myself in the hallways over here singing once. I don't walk around conventions singing, okay? But I found myself in the hallway walking around singing, going, wow, this is cool. Um, so that was a big piece. There were a whole bunch of things, and probably the final thing was probably writing my novel, The Breaking Dawn, because uh, that's a really big novel. And, and while that was happening, I really began to see um, that winning or evolving is probably a better metaphor for me, is really going on, it's really happening. I've read a lot of history and I could see how things went. And after writing that over the next two years, it really coalesced, next few, last few years. So it wasn't a single thing, but it was just something that kept building and building. I went, oh, we could really, really win. Huh. And watching what happened at the end of Rome, that was a big deal for me too, reading enough history books to see it really happened. These guys weren't perfect. They weren't supermen. They were, you know, they had their problems, but they did. Rome went from, uh, Rome turned into Europe, turned to something much, much better. It was interesting. Next, okay, anyone else? Uh, yes. <laughs> so, uh, Subi Music on Twitter a couple of days ago made a really nice uh, tweet. He said, you need to understand how much power and money there is to gain and maintain by keeping a large swath of the population broke, in debt, sick, obese, drug addicted, uneducated, lonely, fearful and divided against one another. Once you understand it, the world makes more sense. I think that's substantially true. I think that's substantially true. And um, it is actually, it has worked really well, and there's particular reasons it's worked. That's another presentation. Um, reasons why it has worked, and there's reasons why it is failing to work uh, psychologically, emotionally. The whole thing is really the establishment as we know it, and the reasons that it works are primate reasons, Mon monkey reasons, chimpanzee reasons. Once that begins to be understood, no one wants to be a chimpanzee. <laughs> you know, do you want to be, you want to act like a monkey or act like a man? Hmm, interesting choice. Um, so the system is a lot more fragile than we think it is, but that is, has been very true. Um, hi, uh, thank you. There's great food of thoughts. I, I wanted to come back to one concept that you mentioned um, that, that can be achieved, as you say, if, if we, you know, if, if we win, if, if the good prevails, the, the comprehensible world. Um, can, you, can you expand a little bit on, on this concept? Because, you know, when, when you say that, the first thing comes to my mind is like, you know, every day, tens of new kinds of scam 
are invented in the world that people, you know, are, are not even able to comprehend. And, um, you know, what, what does it mean, the comprehensible world, and isn't even reachable realistically, you know, regardless what strategy in life we choose? Sure. Okay. There's always going to be a little bit of BS. Okay? That's just the way it is until humanity itself upgrades. There's always going to be some. There's always going to be some ugliness involved. Um, but it doesn't have to be that great. It doesn't have to be that much. And um, life can be so much better than it is, and it has been in pieces and at times. Um, let's, let's pick on my hometown, Chicago. Um, you listen to the news now, and you would think that everybody was being shot every day. And there are problems, and there's sp for specific reasons. But when, when I was a boy, people used to, you know, it was before air conditioning. That's how old I am. Um, there was no air conditioning. So, you know, it gets hot in the summer. And people would actually grab a couple sheets and a couple pillows and go out and sleep on the sand on the lake. Thousands of people. They would just leave their houses and go out and lay down on the sand with their family and everybody sleep out by the lake because it was cooler there. People did those things. This wasn't fake. This was all real. Um, their ladies used to take their, their babies and their little, we call them strollers, prams, you know, baby buggies, and they would all meet at a restaurant and they would leave the buggies out in front on the street and they would go inside in the restaurant and eat and they would get a, a, you know, a table by a window, and the, the babies were all lined up in front of the window, and the ladies would, would be there, and they'd have their you know, ladies group and eat, eat their breakfast, and when one of the babies started crying, <laughs> good timing. <laughs> when one of the babies started crying, one of the ladies, didn't have to be that one's mom, would get up and go take care of the baby and come on back in. And that was life. People lived that way. We can, if we did it then, we could do it now. It's, I, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question precisely. Why we're not? Oh, um, because of uh, fear. We're, we're surrounded by fear. Uh, it's just everywhere. But you've got 24-7 news. You've got, you know, there's a great, uh, there's great stories, you know, some, there's a, a meme about some lady with a, with a clipboard, looks very official and very, you know, agent of the state. And she's talking to the bunch of Amish guys, you know, with the hats and the beards. And she says, how come these problems aren't affecting you? You know, everyone else in the country is, you know, afraid of whatever it was. And they're not affecting you. And these two Amish guys look at each other and go, we don't have TV. <laughs> but it's that. It's really that. And, it, you know, it's, it's all it's complicated. In the 1970s, when we needed to go somewhere, we stuck out our thumb. And God, we all did this. I mean, not all of us. There were a few guys who were afraid. There was always a few guys who were afraid. But we stuck out our thumb and got rides. People weren't terrorized. People weren't afraid in those days. People, we hitched all the time. Um, it wasn't a terror. Uh, and it's, I blame, you know, CNN and, and social media and blah, 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 because whatever is bad is everywhere, in everyone's face right now. There was a study that was done some years ago, and they came up with the final scare line where it said, every 15 or 45 seconds in America, a child goes missing. Okay? Well, it's scary, right? I mean, you know, children being kidnapped, that's horrifying. Well, being a writer, I had enough time to actually dig through the statistics it was that they counted when a kid got lost at the grocery store <laughs> and it came up in front. You know, Mrs. Jones, could you please come up to the front? Your son is here. He can't find you. That counted in their list. And we came to the end of the thing. There were 115 kidnappings in the United States a year. So it's one every three days. Now, it's still bad, but even most of those were a bad problem with a divorce where, you know, the husband or wife said, screw you, I'm taking the kid. Okay. This was technically a kidnapping. It was mostly that. But it's so much fear. It's everywhere. Uh, I, I say we live in a fear soup, but it's really that. We don't believe we can live anymore. We don't trust our neighbors anymore. 
People used to trust their neighbors. Even the ones that are grumpy sometimes. People trusted their neighbors. They relied on their neighbors. And the neighbors stood up to the, to, to the challenge. And they did pretty well. We relied on each other. It really did work. I'm honest to God, I could tell you stories for a long time about, you know, the neighbors doing this. and Because I lived, this was my life. And it was normal for us. And it can be normal now. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for more questions.